So I'm just going to introduce our, our guest today. Um, we have, we're very excited to have Sally Weintraub joining us at the moment. Um, Sally is one of the founder members of the Climate Psychology Alliance, and she's also the chair of the International Psychoanalytic Association, um, Association's Climate Committee. Um, she has just published a new book called Psychological Roots of the Climate Crisis, Neoliberal Exceptionalism and the Culture of Uncare. Um, and she's uh, going to speak to us for about 30, 35 minutes today. And after that, um, we're all going to be invited to ask questions, share experiences um, and generally have a good old chat. Um, so I'm going to shut up with no further ado because I have, don't have anything terribly interesting to say and hand over to Sally. Thank you, Cree. <coughs> um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I just want to make a clarification about Climate Psychology Alliance. It actually was founded by two people, uh, Paul Hoggett and Adrian Tate. Uh, I'm one of the original members, so I've sort of been there from the off. But uh, just to give it a plug, it's, it's well worth joining for those of you who are interested in climate psychology. Uh, it's a great resource and um, offers a lot of support in its own way. So I just want to give it a plug. So I'm going to be, um, as Creep said, uh, talking for about 35 minutes. Um, and um, I'll start. Um, I'm going to read my talk. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a privilege to talk to you tonight. And my subject is, how might we bear our feelings about current climate reality? How might we stay with our feelings? And do we sometimes find them absolutely unbearable? How do we manage when we do? I will draw from arguments that I develop in my new book just out, um, Psychological Roots of the Climate Crisis, just to repeat it, Neoliberal Exceptionalism and the Culture of Uncare. And in it, uh, I argue that exceptionalism, a rigid, narcissistically entitled cast of mind, is largely driving the climate and ecological crises. The problem being that exceptions in this mindset currently are holding global power. Being an exception, to put it very simply, I, of course I fleshed this position out considerably in the book, uh, involves a sense of narcissistic and exaggerated entitlement to these three core beliefs. I am an I stroke we uh, am entitled to see myself as, a, as an ideal version of myself. I stroke we am entitled to whatever I want without limit. Also, I uh, stroke we uh, uh, am entitled not to have to be troubled by the moral consequences of holding this position because I'm ideal and because I'm worth it. So I'm also entitled to use um, omnipotent magical thinking to justify my position. That's essentially in, in a very simple nutshell form what being an exception involves. Now, while we are all more or less, while we all more or less have a part that does think like this, and we mostly manage to rein it in by the part of us that cares, and respects reality, exceptionalism is when exceptions are in charge of the political process and the economy. Exceptionalism as such is old in human history. It underlies our most ancient caste systems and divisive social fracturing into privileged haves and therefore must not haves. In the book, I trace its rapid rise, indeed its mushrooming, and its starting to run amok during the neoliberal era. I show neoliberal ideology to be infused with exceptionalism. And I explore the culture of uncare that neoliberals have spread 
in order to stay in power. Humans are, by nature, morally conflicted beings with both a caring and an uncaring part. The culture of uncare has waged a war of slow violence on our collective caring part and boosted our uncaring part. That is its regressive and infantilizing action. Neoliberalism aggressively deregulates human minds as well as financial markets. Having explored this aggressive psychological deregulation in detail in the book, I turn to CARE's work during the neoliberal age, arguing that CARE is resurgent, powered by lively entitlement, which is very different to narcissistic entitlement, and it's brimming with creative solutions. While exceptionalism fractures common ground, care seeks to repair it. While exceptionalism cannot hear suffering that it necessarily causes uh, or repair problems that it is responsible for, care is up to these challenges. We now need care's voice to advise governments, not lobbyists from the fossil fuel industry. Through its dominant culture, mass media, advertising, political framing, language framing, and the fostering of a group bubble, a group culture, sorry, of a group culture of uncare, exceptionalism seeds and grows fraud bubbles. We have witnessed fraud bubbles during the neoliberal era, an era that began when Reagan and Thatcher took power in the 1980s. The financial crash in 2008 was a fraud bubble bursting. Fraud bubbles are maintained through fostering a magical wonderland inside of which people feel entitled and justified to be exceptions unconstrained by limits. Fraud bubbles encourage a state of mind in which limits can be apparently flouted without there being consequence or without any responsibility consciously felt. Indeed, neoliberal exceptions have whispered throughout uh, the neoliberal era, era, cut regulation, cut care, and cut our ties to reality. That's the right way, and there's no alternative if we are to remain privileged exceptions. The tragedy is that in this state, people can cause colossal damage without realizing this is what they're doing. Because inside the bubble, all signs of damage are kept emotionally minimized and damped down, or they are not seen at all. All bubbles burst. They must do, as reality always wins in the end. Reality is, like death, the distinguished thing, as Henry James put it about death. The problem is that by the time bubbles burst, the damage that they have caused is immense. And we saw that with the financial crash. In the book, I argue that the climate bubble is by far the largest and the most consequential fraud bubble in human history. It relies on stealing a future from the less advantaged living now and stealing any future for all lives yet to come by taking all for now. If we return to my description of the mindset of the exception, this is unproblematic because I am entitled to see myself as ideal, I am entitled to whatever I like, and I am entitled to use magical thinking to make this problem, to make this position seem unproblematic. In the book, I argue that billions have been spent on boosting our inner exception and alienating us from the part that cares and would stand up to it. Some people say we humans are just selfish by nature, but 
If that were the case, this money would not have needed to be spent and it would not have been spent. It was spent because people do care. The culture of uncare has played on people's genuine fragilities in perverse ways to boost omnipotent fantasy solutions and to undermine people's capacity to engage with reality and the hard, painful, ongoing work which that engagement entails. The culture of uncare has boosted the false belief we can live protected, squeaky clean and shiny in a bubble wrapped, wrapped zone. Crucially, it offers no support to people to help them to manage their feelings at seeing the harm the neoliberal economic model has caused to people, to planet and to all living beings. Under neoliberalism, inequality has soared and people have collectively been pushed to steadily to beyond what they can bear. This has happened through a cumulative process that Rob Nixon called slow violence. It is the slow violence of having care eroded bit by bit by bit and the cumulative effects of not being respected and valued, but rather gamed and exploited. One example of the gaming is as people feel increasingly anxious, overburdened and ready to snap, their general sense of unwellness and stress is then commodified by a wellness industry that sells them products apparently to make them feel better. <clears throat> At this point, I will say something about human fragility. Our current dominant culture of uncare uh, tends to portray people as having brains, behaviors, and what it calls narratives. It does not portray people uh, as humans with hearts that can break, with minds that can struggle between feeling over and underwhelmed uh, by traumatizing circumstances, and as having life stories that include suffering. In order to treat people, including ourselves, with greater care, we must first see people as having subjectivity and as being in need of care. Perhaps, along with animals, which we are after all, we needed fully recognized that we are sentient beings capable of intense suffering. I'm referring to the latest restoration of animals as um, having sentience. Perversely, <clears throat> our sentience, our subjectivity and our suffering is recognized to a high degree by this culture when it comes to subtly messaging us to influence us. But when it comes to hearing our complaints in a genuine way, we are ignored. A friend told me that during the first COVID-19 lockdown, the postman brought a parcel. It was labeled fragile, handle with care, with added instructions, caution, living plant inside, avoid snapping its stem. And she immediately thought, that's me. I feel I could snap right now. And she stuck the label on her fridge to remind herself of that. The particular fragility I want to highlight is fragility in coping with realities brought about by neoliberal practices that we inevitably start to experience as too much to bear. When we do snap, we may reach for illusion as, a, as an as if kind of solution. Here, I suggest the injunction fragile, handle with care might come in because we may unsympathetically say that, well, as grown ups, we can and should dispense with illusion and stick with reality. But that would be to ignore or forget that many of us reach for illusion to plaster over moments of extreme 
extreme fragility, when things feel too much to bear, and when we fear we may break, fracture, fragment into bits, or be overwhelmed by excitation or by despair. An example, just one, of illusion employed to cover over a chasm of loss is the folk song, 10,000 Years. This song has endured in many forms. Its theme, I will always love you, I will never ever leave you, I will love you till the rivers run dry, my dear. Many people seem to need a relation with an eternal figure who will never leave them. Is this madness or regression or a way to handle oneself with care when the realities of death, suffering and loss feel too much to bear? I don't have any answers. During COVID, it has been more generally recognized that people have needed handling with great care, particularly in relation to their fragility in facing extended separations and especially when facing death. The injunction, fragile, handle with care, has been so movingly and spontaneously applied in hospitals and care homes with staff and carers holding COVID patients' hands when their families could not be with them, especially those who were dying. It seemed to take some time for officialdom to realize that people need a hand to hold onto. The literal needed physical comfort of someone who you care about and who cares for you. A bulwark against human fragility at moments of terror, of exposure to unmanageable anxieties. Current leadership is not able to offer us a caring hand to help us face climate and environmental reality. It cannot, as its policies still too riven with exceptionalism, are the very policies driving climate breakdown. As we know, COVID only exposed what we already knew about the human need for care and the accelerating lack of care people and planet have been shown during the era of climate derangement. We need governments that care, that care. We need government that cares not government indifference to our suffering. Mental health and sanity are at stake. People differ in their capacity to cope when events threaten to overwhelm them and feel unbearable. Indeed, can all realities be born? Again, I have no answers. Jonathan Lear has suggested that there may be limits to the human mind's capacity to bear reality that this limitation may be an inherent feature of mind itself. Indeed, does staying sane, which requires a feeling relation to reality, involve necessarily, endlessly, sorry, wrestling with the extreme difficulty and necessity of facing the inherent unbearability of engaging fully with reality, especially reality as it presents itself to us now as we take in the extent of damage done and we know that some of it is irre irreparable. For the poet Rilke to fully experience life was to experience sheer terror. Rilke seems to me to have wanted to expose himself to the endless possibility of finding things unbearable as he sought the fullest relationship with reality that he could. I suggest an example of this sort of struggle is a conversation I had recently with a friend and climate colleague. She said she couldn't bear climate news these days. I said I couldn't bear it either. She said she had to bear it to stay sane. And I said, I feel the same. While it's fashionable in our current culture to consider it a sign of strength to ignore or despise our fragility and to tough things out, robust mental strength and mental health admits of fragility and vulnerability, admits that conditions can become unbearable. 
It knows that people need care and to be handled with care. So with this background, I turn now to how do we bear our feelings about the unfolding climate crisis. I hope this will open up in the discussion when we can talk about this together with some to and fro. And I'm aware that only my talk will appear on the web. I feel that's right, but it leads those who may watch the talk online potentially alone with difficult feelings. Here, I want to underscore that coping with climate reality involves work that is best done together, something that Extinction Rebellion knows full well and attends to. I find it always helps to talk about how one is feeling with people who are capable of hearing one, people who are climate aware, meaning they know at first hand at least some of what one is struggling with. In what I say now, I will make just one main point, which is that emerging from the climate bubble to face climate reality can be traumatically hard. We need to pay attention to that, as well as focusing on the undoubted strength people have uh, and apply to face it. So, emerging from the climate bubble. As I said, the climate bubble has served a particular sanitizing psychological function, which is to bleach violence, death and suffering from the picture. The bubble is now bursting. And one sign of the climate bubble bursting is that more people are talking openly about the state of the climate. The psychoanalyst Hannah Siegel argued that to stay silent is, the, is, is, the real, is a crime, it's the real crime, and I would add, that the silence about climate has kept this bubble afloat long enough for the resulting damage to be staggering. Now that the climate bubble is bursting, very broadly speaking, people are responding in two main ways, very broadly speaking. One is trying to preserve bubble thinking, and the other is struggling to face reality, with of course many people veering between the two. I will be concentrating on how hard it is to face climate reality, but first I will mention a common flight fight response, which is Noah's Arkism. The general fantasy system at work with the defense of Noah's Arkism is based on the belief that we are in a privileged group entitled to be saved and to be spared suffering. Why? because we're special and we're worth it. It is the others who will be sacrificed. And this is exceptionalism. The rest of what I say is addressed to those of us who are trying to cope with the shock of emerging from the climate bubble and trying to stay sane when so much damage to our life support systems has already been done. As I said, some of it obviously irreparable. How do we face climate reality? And crucially, how do we work it through? And of course, working it through is an ongoing process. I believe we first need to appreciate that we face not one or a few, but a series of shocks. The first being that climate news is itself shocking. Global warming has largely happened during the last 40 years. It is neoliberalism's legacy. That is shocking. But more shocking is that, as we know, very recently, warming has started to speed up. In addition to shock at the news itself, people are likely to feel assaulted by the very feelings that being in the bubble protected them from. And I want to underscore this point. Group defences against anxiety work by spreading unwanted feelings around among members of the group, thus diluting them, or through manoeuvres like projecting them onto scapegoats and so on. When emerging from a bubble, these feelings are liable to be re-experienced individually, and that can feel shocking. Shame, once unconsciously shared out amongst members of the group, may suddenly be particularly acute. Guilt can be hard to bear with any sense of proportionality, and we may return to guilt in the discussion. 
When I heard, for instance, about the vast number of animals who died in the Australian bushfires, I actually felt ashamed to be a member of my own species. Some feelings released will be melancholic and potentially paralyzing. Others, while very painful, are lively and they're part of grieving, necessary to facing reality and moving on and acting. A further shock is realizing more clearly that most leaders currently in power are still continuing with policies leading to ecocide. Surely our leaders can't be that collectively crazy. Knowing that they are is very hard to bear. Then there is the collapse of our own omnipotence that can cause further shock. We're no longer inside the climate bubble. We have radically to reevaluate our sense of ourselves. We start to see how easily seducible we are and how prey to colluding with corrupting political propaganda designed to supporting continuing with business as usual. We may feel shocked at seeing when and where we allowed ourselves to be duped. We may feel shocked and heart sore to realize the extent of the corruption of truth that has occurred. It is also deeply replenishing to emerge from a bubble, which is in effect a collective psychic retreat from reality, to see the real picture more clearly. Stepping out of the bubble uh, enables us to see strength and beauty in the interconnected systems that support life and also to see the fragility in those systems and the moral imperative for humans to respect their limits in the way they live their lives. With this background, my question is, how do we work through the tragedy unfolding and stay sane? We need to find the answers together for my part, these days, I read as much environmental news as possible, but never ever before going, writing or sleeping as it's too disturbing and it makes me too anxious. And I'm not alone. Many people are reporting eco-anxiety and eco-trauma, which unless crippling is on the side of life. It is care's alarm call to face reality and to act. And I want to talk about climate trauma because we may feel traumatized by climate news. Trauma can overwhelm the capacity to think clearly. It can leave people struggling with feeling over and underwhelmed by the traumatizing events. Traumatized people can find it harder to judge whom is to blame with any sense of proportion. I have found studying war trauma in soldiers very helpful when thinking about potential climate trauma. And I'll briefly look at pre and post traumatic stress disorder and also moral injury, which is classed in its, in its own right as a trauma. Uh, PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder, shatters people's sense of safety and moral injury shatters people's sense of trust. This is our world today. We have our sense of safety and trust being shattered. Often uh, these conditions both occur together. First, PTSD. Here, one's sense of safety has been traumatically shattered and where one may constantly relive the trauma in the present, feeling that danger may strike again uh, at any moment. This is called hyperarousal. Many PTSD sufferers eventually convert hyper, hyper arousal into hyper constriction, where all emotions, even pleasure, are toned down and experiences are avoided that might evoke any feelings of threat. To what extent are many of us hyper vigilantly, vigilantly on the lookout for climate information and using hyperconstriction to protect our hearts and minds from overwhelm in traumatizing conditions. Then there's pre-traumatic stress disorder. This uh, is the trauma that soldiers suffer in prolonged situations of helpless anticipation of a future traumatizing event. The psychiatrist, Lise, Lise van Susteren, 
sees our stress at anticipating in impending climate breakdown as a form of pre-traumatic stress disorder. And, of course, right now people across the world and climate refugees are already experiencing traumatic climate events, their situation worsened by COVID-19 and the added eco economic hardship it brings. When a journalist asks me, how do we tell people about the climate emergency without traumatizing them? I said, well, it's not easy to know how, but I firmly believe what matters is whether we give truthful pictures about the future uh, as we can imagine it in a caring way, not in a careless switched off way that does not relate to how people might be feeling. I now turn to moral injury, the violation of our sense of what's right. Studying stories of morally injured soldiers reveals this pattern. A sense of betrayal by a leadership that idealized the view and hid the truth, that lied, that devalued life and was casual about killing. The helplessness of feeling caught up in a vast machine that prevents one from acting with care and conscience. The collapse of one's inner ideals. Feeling one's own experience and sense of reality is brushed aside and does not count. This could be a description of what many people now report feeling about the economic and political world in which they live, one that inevitably generates a climate crisis. The global economy now structures how people live in ways that conflict with their ordinary human decency. Daily life for the more affluent, particularly in the global north, is fraught with moral dilemmas. Do I take the car, the bus or the bike? Do I buy that book online from a company that employs people on zero hours contracts? What do I do when nearly everything I buy comes wrapped up in plastic? My very way of living causes environmental and social damage. How do I live then with the guilt and shame of my participation? The actual suffering of moral injury is a sign of mental health, not disorder. It means one's conscience is alive. Staunching and repairing moral injury involves psychic work, facing remorse, seeking forgiveness, gaining new understanding of one's individual culpability and being able to place that in a wider context. It is in these ways that shattered ideals can be rebuilt and what's right refound amid the scars. Judith Herman, who studied survivors of trauma, is one of a number who have argued, and I include the environmental movement as well, that social action serves as the strongest antidote to traumatic experience. It creates, in her words, an alliance with others based on cooperation and shared purpose. I believe that with the breaking with the current culture of uncare requires stopping colluding with this culture and that requires a collective effort of working through grief, remorse and a reshouldering of collective responsibility. And it matters greatly that this is undertaken in a general spirit of understanding and forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. That was, um, that was really, really interesting. Um, and I can see from the uh, chat that's been going on while you've been speaking that we've got a number of people in the group that have already um, read your book um, and are already making kind of comments on that. So um, 